Great, thanks very much. Great. Okay, well, hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming out on this rainy day, and thanks to the organizers for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Cambridge professionally. I was an undergraduate next door, but uh, it's much nicer visiting as an adult. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me get started and thank my collaborators. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Joel Moore for introducing me to these ideas for the first time. So in a sense, he's responsible for what you're about to hear. Um, okay, so we've had four hydrodynamics introductions all of which are excellent, as well as a thermalization introduction. So I'm going to give another thermalization introduction since I was uh, torn between the two choices. Um, so as all of you know, the original non-thermalizing system is the Fermi Pasta Ulam chain, which uh, stimulated a lot of the advances in this field and has continued to provide a touchstone uh, for developments in nonlinear dynamics. Of course, the surprise was they expected ergodicity um, at non-zero um, energy and didn't observe it. They saw perfect revivals at long times instead. And at the time this result was found surprising, questioned, uh, interrogated, but from a modern viewpoint, it's actually not so surprising. And the reason is that the initial conditions considered by FPUT were rather special. They didn't actually have an extensive energy density. And so from that point of view, from a modern point of view, we don't even expect them to thermalize because um, one should really start with a finite energy density to be probing thermalization. Um, so a recent stimulus for such questions, um, a more recent stimulus is this quantum Newton's cradle experiment. So now we are actually genuinely in a finite temperature regime. We're putting an extensive energy into the system and allowing these two clouds of rubidium atoms to bounce off each other. Um, it's quite an unusual Hamiltonian because it's torn between two integrable points. On the one hand, you have the harmonic trap, which is integrable. On the other, you have this Lieb-Linegar gas that we just heard about from Benjamin, which is also integrable. Uh, and for this reason, uh, the model appears not to exhibit any thermalization on the accessible experimental time scale. Um, so as mentioned, it's always near integrable, but this, this is difficult to make precise. Uh, and recent... Uh, I think so, yeah. In fact, more recent experiments have tested generalized hydrodynamics predictions based on this model to, to good accuracy. So, so it is good enough. Um, yeah, so as, as written below, there are versions from the last five or so years stimulated by, by the advent of generalized hydrodynamics. Uh, but I want to emphasize that from a physics viewpoint, it was this experiment which has actually motivated a lot of the investigation of the equilibrium and far from equilibrium dynamics of uh, integrable systems. Um, okay, so, so we had this experiment in 2008. And a question you can ask is, what theory do we actually need to describe what we're seeing experimentally? So it's large scale dynamics. These are order 100 to 1,000 particles in a bosonic Hilbert space, which is already harder to control than, say, fermions or spins. And it's also dynamics at non-zero temperature. So this means that in exact treatment, even manipulating, say, beta wave functions is probably going to be hopeless. You're just not in that kind of regime. And so the natural, the natural thing to try is hydrodynamics, i.e. the large-scale dynamics of the system near integrability. Um, but this is a very hard problem. And um, we, we've heard a lot about the hydrodynamics of integrable systems. Uh, let me just remind you why near integrable systems are difficult and how little is actually understood about them. Um, so... Again, it's no surprise to anyone in this room that classically this is in principle well understood. There's this kolmogorov arnold moser theorem from the 50s and 60s saying that if we have an integrable Hamiltonian and perturb it by a chaotic Hamiltonian, uh, integrability will survive in some 
uh, fraction of phase space that is relatively large for a relatively small perturbation. Um, and this has been known for a long time, uh, but what actually happens at large n has not received much attention, partly because it's just such a difficult problem. So our generic expectation in statistical physics is that the threshold for chaos in a many-body system, uh, the threshold perturbation strength, should actually go to zero as the system size goes to infinity. And you can see this as being a conjecture for what the radius of convergence of the KAM method looks like. Uh, when I say this fraction of phase space, I've left out the end dependence, and um, it's conjectured that the radius of convergence shrinks in this way. Uh, if you go back to the original KAM analysis and go through it carefully, as Wayne did in this uh, classic paper, you see it has a, a tiny radius of convergence that's ridiculously small, one over n factorial to a power. So that's much too small to be useful for practical uh, purposes. And Wayne actually made quite a big advance, which was in a specific class of systems showing this could be reduced to a power law, which while still ludicrously large, is in principle much closer to the kind of result we, we want. Um, um, so now let me turn to the quantum problem, um, for which there are no rigorous results, but what we do have are physical pictures. And the breakthrough result was this paper by Altshuler, Geffen, Kamenev, and Levitov in 1996, who predicted that chaos in a particular model, so, so to be precise, they took a two fermion quantum dot and perturbed it with random four fermion interactions. Um, and they predicted this specific scaling form of the threshold perturbation strength to chaos. And this is actually what's now known as a many body delocalization transition for those of you familiar with. So there's been a lot of study of many body localization in disordered systems, but it actually started from this uh, paper, which was just trying to understand broken integrability. Uh, now, in that paper, they also conjectured that all quantum integrable systems should behave in this way. So have some power law sensitivity to chaos. Uh, but actually, it took us about a year to realize that was probably too hasty. And that assumes some features of the interaction, namely that it's somehow local in Fox space as it takes you, as it spreads um, quasi particles out and destroys integrability. Uh, so if you want a precise uh, definition of what I mean by a Fox space here, please ask me after the talk. But the basic point is that if your chaotic interaction is short ranged, then you recover this AGKL phenomenon of power law sensitivity. And for, for longer range interactions in Fox space, for example, if you break a, a Jordan Wigner string in a fermion model, in a spin model, uh, you expect exponential sensitivity to chaos. Um, so either way, using physics style arguments based on delocalization theory, we get these predictions. And the reason for this detour is it tells us that the problem which motivated all of this, the quantum Newton's cradle, it's most likely chaotic. But maybe that's what's not interesting about the model. The interesting thing experimentally was this non-thermalizing transient. Um, so now I'm going to go back to how we understand this non-thermalizing transient. Um, and as we've heard in these four of these previous talks, the effective dynamics without a trap, when we just have Lieb-Linegar, is, uh, is described by an effective soliton gas, where in the quantum case, you don't have solitons, but you have quasi-particles. And the quantum phase shift um, gives you a classical time delay by this analysis of Wigner from the 50s. Um, so, so that's how we understand dynamics without the trap. Now, at first sight, it's a little surprising that this could actually describe a strongly interacting quantum system. Uh, so one thing we did do are some precision numerical tests back in 2017 on a local equilibrium state, where here we have a temperature that is defined at each site of the Hamiltonian, and we follow the evolution of the on-site energy density. And I want to emphasize this is precision numerics, the tensor network method used here has a controllable discarded weight, which is usually at least at most 10 to the minus six and often 10 to the minus nine in practice. So we really are simulating the quantum dynamics. And as you can see, it agrees perfectly at short times. So, so I'm starting here from an inhomogeneous temperature profile in the model and just 
letting it relax and um, and hydrodynamics does the trick. Um, so now uh, let's try to introduce a trap, again, motivated by the integrability breaking trap in this experiment. Um, and in standard Boltzmann theory, what we do to include a force term is write this term fx derivative with respect to momentum. Um, and uh, this does actually seem to work well. We benchmarked it numerically first against hard rods, and later Benjamin and collaborators show that it actually describes the experiment very well um, up to the time of the experiment breaking down. Uh, but it's important to emphasize, even in our hard rod simulation, we saw chaos show up at a late enough time, and this equation stopped being valid at that time. Um, and I want to emphasize, there's a fundamental reason to, to want to criticize this equation. It's that the potential should generically generate a quasi-particle lifetime. Your quasi-particles are no longer infinitely long-lived, but that kinetic theory is a model of infinitely long-lived quasi-particles. So if K stops being a good quantum number, stops being a good spectral index, if you like, this, this equation is, is being pushed beyond its uh, naive regime of validity. Um, so, so to summarize, this, this soliton gas picture actually provides the first compelling scheme for modeling this Newton cradles some eight years after the experiment. So it really was a big breakthrough. This AMO experiment had been sitting there and no one had come up with a really good theory. Uh, to describe it, basically, because Lieblinger has so many conservation laws. Um, and as mentioned, it's remarkably accurate until dynamical chaos sets in. Uh, so if we want to actually understand when this equation breaks down, which is to say when this Newton's cradle stops being described by hydrodynamics, um, we, we need to benchmark the equation. And, and classical systems are still best for this kind of benchmarking because quantum systems as of today are still prohibitively hard to simulate. Without a quantum computer, I have no simple way of actually realizing the quantum Newton's cradle on my laptop or even simple, simpler versions of it with fermions or spins. The system sizes are just too small. I think, yeah, quantum computers are currently up to about 50 qubits. The experiment starts at about 100 particles, you're just, you're just not in the right regime. Um, so, so for precise tests of this equation, classical systems are still best, and this requires a precise understanding of the hydrodynamics of classical integral systems. Um, now, both Herbert and Benjamin showed how precise that understanding can get. Uh, let me present a slightly different model, which is the a Calogero model where I think the story becomes exceptionally clear. Um, okay, so, so one comment first on continuous versus discrete classical models. Um, if we want analytical control of this hydrodynamics, PDEs are actually not ideal. And the reason is if you try to initialize a finite temperature state of a PDE, you excite a lot of stuff. You have solitons, you have radiations, and as I learned at this conference, you have a lot of stuff that is just other. A lot of these solutions that uh, arise that uh, might be difficult to capture analytically. Um, so the simple non-trivial case is probably this uh, equation for hard rods uh, that we heard about just now, I think was first written down by Perkis, who actually also had this contraction map in his paper, <laughs> uh, later elevated to a theorem. Um, so for my purposes, the next simplest model is actually the rational Calogero model. And people were studying this model for completely different reasons in the early 2000s. Basically, you can show that it's zero temperature large scale dynamics is connected to the Benjamin Ono equation. And that's some very beautiful work, which uh, includes dispersive behavior. Uh, for this talk, I'm concerned with uh, ballistic behavior at non-zero temperature which, as we'll see, will require some slightly new ideas. Um, so this is the quantum rational Calogero model. Uh, and actually, we can guess the kinetic equation for the classical system from the quantum system. Uh, here, the differential phase shift is a delta function. 
um, it looks like it should do something that it actually doesn't. Physically speaking, it just corresponds to a change of statistics, which means that asymptotically, the particles behave as if they're free, and I can describe their thermodynamics as just uh, tunable statistics. Um, so what this implies eventually is that this interaction dressed velocity that uh, we've heard about in soliton gases and integrable systems um, is actually just the bare velocity of the particles. So, so this whole soliton hydrodynamics becomes extremely trivial. And in fact, you, you come to the conclusion that the quantum Boltzmann equation for the Calogero model is apparently just the freely streaming Boltzmann equation uh, that you learn about in the first course on condensed matter physics. Um, and this is, um, this is not very exciting. You can take the semi-classical limit and do it really carefully, and you just get the obvious conclusion that you again get a free equation. Um, now, at first sight, this is a bit trivial, uh, and it's a bit strange because the model really is strongly interacting. The inverse square interaction is very singular. Um, and what you find is that actually eight is not as innocent as it looks. If you try and compare it with a conventional phase space distribution function in terms of X and P, you find that uh, it doesn't, P does not match the microscopic momentum at all. Um, um, so the question, so one question is, what is rho P actually a density of? What is this parameter P that's appearing here? And how can such a simple equation give a complete description of the local equilibrium dynamics? Because if it's really describing the finite temperature dynamics of the system, it has to somehow capture almost all of the classical excitations in measure. Otherwise, it wouldn't be describing finite temperature dynamics. Um, so I'm going to try to answer this question in my remaining time. Uh, so the answer we proposed is that rho should be viewed as a local density of classical quasi-particles. Uh, and this is not a very standard notion in classical integrable system. Uh, so let me explain what I mean. Our starting point is this lax pair formalism for the Calogero dynamics. So, so just for context here, you have n particles, and you're expressing the dynamics of these n classical particles now in terms of two coupled n by n matrices. So loosely speaking, X can be thought of as a position matrix, L can be viewed of as a momentum matrix, and in some sense, these are the Heisenberg equations of motion associated with this uh, operator I that generates some kind of rotation. Um, so now the claim is that this lax pair dynamics is actually what's controlling the hydrodynamic equation I postulated on the last slide. And that what I'm getting when I take the semi classical limit of that quantum equation is actually classical analogs of beta quasi particles. And these quasi particles should be thought of as eigenvectors of the lax matrix. Um, so we first pointed. Uh, or propose this picture in the context of the TODA model, since that was amply covered uh, by Herbert today, I decided to focus on Calogero, um, where the, the same story appears to hold. Um, so so what, what do I mean by this? Um, let's take this matrix L, which has this interpretation of momentum, and look at its jth eigenvector. Uh, then something you find, uh, which is quite nice is that taking the expectation value of the lax equations in this eigenvector gives you essentially the dynamics of a freely streaming particle. So this is telling you that if you like the exact microscopic dynamics corresponding to that kinetic equation is the dynamics in a single lax eigenvector. So we've taken the, the lax isospectral flow and we've expressed it as free streaming of this quasi-particle J. Um, at this point, uh, you might think we're done because any distribution function of objects that satisfies this will trivially satisfy the hydrodynamics exactly. So then we would have proved hydrodynamics for this system. Uh, the problem is, and this is a really a question of taste, is that this expectation value of X is highly non-local. 
So the help to draw a picture here. Um, so I have the physical sites of my model. And I take one of these lambda j's. And what it really is, is some vector that has support in all the components of the physical positions, but is actually completely non-local in space. So if I try to write down the naive empirical distribution function, um, describing this kind of thing, it would be very non-local in space because this average position um, depends on all the particle coordinates. Um, so we eventually realized that the correct thing to do is to continue to view the eigenvector as an extended object with weight at um, depending on the physical position, but to actually use this weight just as a coefficient in a genuinely local distribution function. Um, so that led to this conjecture for what the empirical distribution function should be for the Collagero model. And it's really this amplitude for a classical quasi-particle to be at site X summed over these delta functions telling you uh, specifying position X and momentum lambda. Um, now, there are a few simple sanity checks you can do. Is if you integrate this over position and momentum, you recover the conserved charges. You get powers of the trace of the lax matrix as you should. Um, and so, yeah, it passes uh, quite a few uh, sanity checks. So, so for homogeneous states, we recover those uh, nice equilibrium results of the nature Herbert showed us this morning, which is to say uh, expressions in translation invariant systems of what the density and current should be. Uh, but we can actually go a step further. If you plug this empirical uh, distribution function into the microscopic dynamics, you get an equation of this form, which you see is exactly the free streaming Boltzmann equation plus a small correction. And this correction is a commutator correction between what I was calling the position and the momentum. Uh, and what this means is that this equation whose validity we tried to test is actually only valid provided this commutator is small. And if you remember your quantum mechanics, that commutator is exactly what appears on the right-hand side of the uncertainty principle. So in terms of our classical quasi-particle interpretation, this is saying that this uh, soliton gas description is only valid provided our classical quasi-particles are very well localized in space. In other words, that this, uh, this object I drew is uh, sharply peaked. Um, and by using physics type reasoning for the Collagero model at finite temperature, you can argue that, again, localization theory predicts that it is indeed somewhat peaked. The tail actually decays as a power law, but that seems to be good enough. Yeah. Uh, whatever you want. So, so you can add a force term in the lax equations, and it just appears where you'd expect it to, which is P dot equals F. And then you get the, the dynamics like this. Um, yes, yes. So, so, so this is an exact expression for the dynamics of perturbed Collagio. And if one could understand the commutator corrections and control them precisely, um, one would have proved uh, generalized hydrodynamics for this model. Um, and uh, so we tested this numerically, and it's apparently true. We quenched from zero temperature to a trap which should have had no integrable properties at all. And we did see perfect agreement with numerics. The reason this is a, is a stringent test, because as you go to zero temperature, this localization property actually should break down. So, so somehow low temperatures and breaking integrability are the strongest tests of this equation, and it does appear to pass them. Um, the second question you can ask is, this model has some solitons. How are they captured by this approach? Because now the claim is really that this rho p is capturing the entire spectral data of the integrable system in some sense. Um, so for example, it's known that classical Collagero in a harmonic trap has soliton solutions. 
So we decided just to see what happens when you plot this empirical distribution function for a known two soliton solution. And what you see is that the dynamics, so on the right is how you might initially think of this soliton solution. You have a dense uh, system of particles and you let one particle go through all the others. So those are the two sinusoidal shapes and they just um, continue to oscillate periodically. So in real space, it's something quite complicated. It's a genuinely collective effect. But you see that armed with this Boltzmann description, which is now the Boltzmann equation in the harmonic trap, which has perfectly circular characteristics and perfect revivals, the soliton dynamics just becomes a simple rotation in phase space. And it's just these two peaks of phase space density that are, are describing this quite complicated real space soliton excitation. Um, so, so in that sense, we believe this description reconstructs any other excitation you might be able to cook up um, using uh, integrability subject to, let's say, sensible boundary conditions. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. These are the papers that I talked about uh, in this talk, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions now or later. Uh, thanks. Questions? Thank you very much for, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, is it correct? Well, it is my kind of hypothesis. Of, so the corresponding uh, kind of PDE model for this PDE, PD, I mean, solid on gas for PDE mm. would be uh, Benjamin Ono. So uh, maybe in a trap, maybe with, with the potential. I don't, so we didn't think about the dispersive term at all, but I mean, presumably it's there if you go up from zero temperature. Because, because it, it, it is it is a PD for corresponding to, to Calogero model. Yeah, so, so actually, not, not all, all yes, so with this bidirectional. I think they might have discussed this. I think they may have figured out that connection, actually. I think there maybe is some connection. So maybe between. it's worth looking, well, yeah. just uh, have a look at yeah. uh, solid on gas picture for Benjamin Ono. Yes, I because they, they were definitely thinking about that uh, Benjamin Ono. Yeah, I, I would think so. that yeah. Paper, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Just I wanted to make a comment about mm. uh, your definition of the of the density. So in fact, uh, you say you check that when you integrate over x, you get the right constant yeah. quantities and all that. So in fact, that's all you need, right? All you need is that you have an operator or an observable that is local enough, which I think you check, mm. and that integrates to the constant quantity. Because in in the end, these densities have a gauge ambiguity. You know, you can always mm -hmm. add a derivative knowledge. You can define it whatever, however you want, as long as it's local, integrates the comp the, the full con conserved density. Yeah, quantity. I and think so that's I, fine. Then what you I don't know. I I think what's confusing me is that this this thing actually does survive, does satisfy the equations exactly, but this is somehow not the right thing to consider because it's so non-local. Yeah, yeah, but so that's but when you do something local. Yeah. as long as you can prove that the yeah. total x integral is a conserved quantity, if you can prove that. Then that's it. Then you have uh, you have the right object. If it's local and integrates to constant quantity, is the right object. Or is it one choice that's, of the right object? Yeah, I see. It. Yeah, maybe let's discuss. Off it. I agree. I think the corrections to both are somehow small in the ballistic. Yeah, so scaling then, them. Yeah. Anyway, just a comment. <laughs> okay. So thanks for the again. Let's. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Dimitri Gaponsev. Dimitri, can you hear us? Uh, can you unmute yourself? Please. Sharing your screen. Yes. Do you hear me? Uh, 